of all the word that he has breathed into this book. So Holy Spirit, now we reach out. Come on, help me, join with me. We reach out now and we ask you to come and encounter us with your word. We ask you to plant in our hearts like your garden, your words like seed and let them take root and take hold and grow and produce fruit for the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the precious, powerful, living word of God. How you have privileged us. How you have honored us. How you have blessed us by giving us your word. We don't take it lightly or for granted, Lord. It's not just another book. It's the book that you breathe out of your very essence to give to us and to show us who Jesus is. Let it happen tonight. Let the eyes of our hearts be open. Let our ears be open. Let our eyes be open. Our hearts be receptive. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you good with that? All right. Second Timothy. We didn't quite finish chapter two. We only got through half of chapter two last time. So I want to start at verse 14. I think we can um, do this. Get to start at chapter two, verse 14, and get through chapter three as well. Um, so let's read, starting at verse 14, and uh, I want to read down several verses, maybe down to verse 18, and then let's um, talk about some of the truths that are in here. Verse 14 of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, mm. which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Mm -hmm. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. We talked about that a little bit last week. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene or cancer. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they have upset or overturned the faith of some. And so, one of the things that Paul is dealing with, and Timothy is dealing with, in Ephesus, Timothy's there overseeing. He's trying to put things in divine order. One of the things that they're dealing with there is false teaching, right? We, we encounter this. We don't know exactly everything about the false teaching. We know a few things that he throws in. One of the things that he throws in here in verse 18 is that they were teaching, Hymenaeus and Philetus, that the resurrection had already happened of believers. Um... And they were overturning the faith of someone. So we're going to talk about this just a little bit. I want, to, I want to talk about false teaching. But look at verse 14 and verse 16. I want to show you how Paul characterizes some of this false teaching. He says, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. And then verse 16, mm -hmm. avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. So how does he characterize the false teaching? It's empty chatter, it's worldly, it's useless, and it leads to further what? It leads to what? What does false teaching lead to? It leads to ungodliness. So you, need, you need to pick up that point because here's, here's what happens and here's what Paul's going to explain as we get further on there. I, I want to ask you the question tonight, like how do you identify false teaching? So what is the difference between a difference of opinion in interpreting Scripture and what the Bible would call false teaching? Because it's important. Paul said that false teaching in the body of Christ is like gangrene and cancer. You don't just go, oh, well, that's okay. That's cool. If you want to spread cancer in the body, that's really cool. No, no, you, you can't allow that to happen. So false teaching you have to go after and you have to... Remove it, right? Right? One of, the, one of the qualifications or one of the duties of elders is that they must be able to refute false teaching. Right. So here's my question to you. And I want us to think through this because this is an important issue. What, how do you identify false teaching as opposed to somebody that has a different interpretation of Scripture from you? Anybody? Their lifestyle. 
Their lifestyle. That's good. Anybody else? That's the line up with the word. Okay. That's good. Anybody else? So. Say, say it real loud. If it's leading to ungodliness. Okay, right. And I think that ties in with lifestyle, right? Okay, so she said it's leading to ungodliness. Yeah, Paul mentions this more than once in here. And, and here's, um, we're going to see that when we get into chapter 3. So, lifestyle leads to ungodliness. The Word of God contradicts other scripture, right? What, what else would characterize false teaching? The fruit of their life. Okay. If their uh, life is bearing good fruit for okay. the kingdom. Yeah, I think we covered that. That's what you mentioned before, lifestyle. Okay. Um, that you can get yourself out of this rather than going to God. Okay. All right. Self-help. I would say, so So let me, let me put these three points. Let, let me tie in with what you said there in, in this way. I think that false teaching has at least these three uh, things that are involved with it, or one of the three or some of these. Okay. Number one, here's the question. You need to ask, how does it treat or relate to Jesus Christ, the living word? How does it relate to Jesus Christ, the living word? In other words, we sang that song tonight. It's one of my favorite songs in the whole world. All is for his glory. Okay. The Father God has one agenda that overrides every other agenda. It is Colossians 1.18, which says that Jesus Christ was the first born from the dead so that in everything he might have first place so in everything in your life everything in this nation everything in this world everything in this universe the father's agenda is always about jesus christ being preeminent being exalted being first place being the one who has highest honor that's that's the father's agenda always that's his agenda in our life that's why sometimes he allows things in our lives that don't feel good but he's working his larger agenda. His number one agenda in our, in our life isn't our comfort. How many find that out? Hmm. No, Father's number one agenda in your life is not your comfort or your happiness. It really isn't. Like, unless you view it from an eternal perspective, then it is. But not from a temporal happiness perspective. His agenda in our lives is that Jesus Christ would be made much of, that he would be exalted. Like Paul said in Philippians 1 that we mentioned, he said, it doesn't matter whether I live or die. What matters is that Jesus Christ is exalted in my body, whether by my life or by my death. That's what really matters. And ultimately, like this is striking to us because our culture is so steeped in humanism that man is the highest good and the highest goal. But that is antithetical to the whole creation of the universe. The universe was created by him and for him. him. Everything was meant to bring glory and pleasure to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Father's agenda remains constant. If teaching begins to detract from that agenda, Jesus Christ is demoted to a God with a little G like in Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, automatically, no. False. That's false teaching. Jesus Christ is the one who's exalted. And he is preeminent and he is the center. If man uh, begins to become the center and Jesus is not, Jesus now becomes the servant of man and man's happiness, it's false. It's it's false. We breathe the air of humanism every day. And so God gets accused of a lot of things because he's he's being accused of being unjust. God's never been unjust. There's no person who's ever lived who is going to stand before God on the judgment day and say, you were unfair to me and I did not get what I deserved. The only people that are not going to get what they deserve are those who put their faith in Jesus Christ and His blood because what we all deserve was hell and damnation. We have a very shallow... I'm not saying it enough. I'm just saying, in general, in our culture, like, sin is minimized. It's a mistake. We're, we're all weak. We're all... But, but in, in God's perspective, if you read how He describes 
the sin of humanity, it's described as treason and rebellion because every person was created for God and for His glory. That's why when the Bible says in Romans 3.23, we all fall short. We have fallen short of the what? Glory of the glory of God. Because we were created to glorify Him. And like what I say about myself, and it's really true, like I love the candy bar more than I love God. So I wasn't glorifying him by saying, God, I love this candy bar. But I, I mean, I wouldn't say that with my lips. But that's how I live my life. I loved any kind of sensual pleasure more than I love God. My thoughts were not on God. You see, was I glorifying him? He created me in his image. Why did he create me in his image? Because I'm supposed to image him and say, I'm created in his image. And this is what he looks like. This is what he does. This is what he acts. And so the whole of creation the Bible says in Romans 3, in Paul's presentation of the gospel, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who seeks after God. There is none. Like, how many does that leave? Mm. So, so, from, so I'm, I'm telling you, there's a human perspective of sin and brokenness. And, and we like to use words like brokenness and all that. And, and I, I think that there's... I'm not saying the Lord's not compassionate. Get what I'm saying, though. In the big scope of things, everyone is guilty before the Lord, right? Does, does the scripture say this? Everyone is guilty before them. Everyone. Everyone. And so damnation would be justice for every single person. God has never treated anyone unjustly and never will. And the Bible says that justice is the foundation of his throne, but we have an entitled mindset as human beings, and we think that God owes us because we're actually pretty good people. We're, we're really pretty good. And, and so here, here's what I like to say. For believers, like we can't buy into the humanistic lie that we were really pretty good and Jesus just came on the scene to improve our life and to give us a better deal here like them. No, he walked on the platform where we were going to be hanged in the gallows and he took our head out of it and he put his own head in it. That's what happened. Do you see how understanding that, like people are like, oh, don't talk about the depravity of men. Why not? It is the biggest trigger for worship in the universe. That's right. Dude, he didn't just come and take a nice person and make them nicer. He came and took a rebel that looked into his face every moment of the day and I said, Lord, you don't matter, I matter. It's not what you care about, it's what I care about. And if you serve what I care about, then you're useful. If not, get out of my life. That's the way I lived. That's the way you live, probably. Yes. And Jesus came into that situation. And he said, this isn't just a little cute little bird with a broken wing. This is a rebel against Almighty God and his purpose for being created. But he came to me and he said, I'm going to give my life for you. Why? This is, when we think of the love of God, we should never have entitled thoughts. We should fall on our knees and go, this is crazy. This is insane. Why would you die for me? It makes no sense. No. But it demonstrates the greatness of the love of the Father. When he got me, he didn't get a good deal. <laughs> His blood wasn't an even trade for me. The cross wasn't supposed to demonstrate our value. What it demonstrated primarily was the greatness of the love of the Father who owed us absolutely nothing but eternal damnation. <laughs> this is why we will worship in heaven. Do you know what happens around the throne? Who stands in the center of the throne? Jesus is in the center of heaven. And everybody's gathering around gazing upon him and worshiping him and saying, worthy are you to receive glory, honor, and praise, and might, and riches, and dominion forever and ever. For you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tongue and tribe and kindred and nation. Dude, 
we're going to be there. Thank we are going Jesus. to do this in the presence of the angels. Thank and when he comes on the scene, the most holy, the most faithful, the most loyal servants of the Lord throughout all of history immediately are going to take their crown, which is their reward, and they're going to cast it at his feet. This, this is glorious worship in heaven. This is what the whole universe revolves around. Jesus is the center of everything. He's the center of the universe. That's what Christianity is about. Any teaching that demotes Jesus to second place or servant of my happiness, or whatever, is false. He's not. He's the sovereign Lord. Yeah. And he's amazing. Like the, I, I don't know how I feel like, does this ever, I just say that a lot, like, this is crazy. Yes, it is. This is crazy. It's amazing. Worship comes out of a heart that says, this is crazy. How, what am I doing here? What, what, what were you thinking when you came and redeemed me? You're amazing. Jesus is the center. That's true teaching. That's, he is the treasure. He is the reward. Streets of gold are not your reward. Mansions in heaven is not your reward. Jesus being there is your reward. Yeah, yeah. Everything else is like gold in heaven is like sawdust. You're not going to go, oh man, dude, I got some bling. No, you don't care about bling. You care about the one who thought up and created bling. Mm. See, it's not the pleasures of life that he gives us. It's our hearts saying, not this thing, Lord, that you've given me. Not sex, not food, not a, a comfortable bed, whatever you want. Not my children. But it's you who gave these things that is the desire of my heart. Jesus is the center. This is how you recognize whatever starts to drift towards something else being the center, red flag. Red flag. The scriptures are all written about him. They all speak of him. Anything that starts to drift from that center, red flag. Number two, how does it treat this is the second question you ask. How does it treat the scripture? The rest of scripture. What I mean is, does it take only a small section of scripture and minimize or suppress or ignore or chop off the rest of the revelation of scripture? That's a red flag for false teaching. You know, most false doctrines in church history started with the truth. Hmm. But there was a truth that got out of balance because all of the balancing truth in Scripture was suppressed or ignored or pushed down, and that was magnified to such a great degree. Probably what happened in Ephesus. So why do you think someone would say that the resurrection of believers has already happened? Why would they, why would this be part of their doctrine or this false teaching in Ephesus? Just, just take a guess. Just take a guess. Yeah, yeah. So I think probably, I mean, I don't know, but do you think it's not probable? I mean, this is the last letter that Paul wrote. So this is the end of his life. Do you think it's probable since Paul stayed in Ephesus and since he ministered, he said that he exhorted them day and night with tears, all the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. So he was all in with these guys. These, this is where these false teachers came from. So they knew Paul's teaching about you have been raised together with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places, right? Romans 6, you died with him, you were raised up with him. So it seems to me it's a good possibility that they took those truths that were true and they started running with that and leaving behind all the rest of the revelation of Scripture that Paul's giving even here. And just ran with that and made up, who knows what all, we don't know what all the doctrine was, it doesn't really matter. But they began to run with that like we do, we've already been raised from the dead, we have a glorified body. So what does that mean? Well, it could mean a lot of things. It could mean, well, now we can't sin because we have a glorified body, so... Let's just do whatever we feel like doing because like, it's not sin because then we really have to go. You see, you see how this leads, leads to all kinds of mischief. 
So how could they do that? Well, they couldn't do that if they listened to all the false teaching. But they just took one aspect of it and they magnified that to such a degree that it became false. Even though it was true to start with. Mm. You see what I'm saying? That's how false teaching starts in very many instances. Um, how does it treat the rest of Scripture? How does it relate to the rest of Scripture? Is Scripture... That seems to be a balancing truth or even a paradox. How many know that scripture is full of paradoxes? How many, if you read the scripture and you go, how can that be when this over here says this? Like, how does this go together, right? Come on, you guys ever wrestled like this? You know what? The Lord wants us to wrestle like that because truth in scripture is so often held in the, in the tension between seeming contradictions. It's called paradox. Is it man's free will or is it God's sovereign choice? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, which one is it? It's both. <laughs> no, it can't be both. I had a guy ask me one time, he's trying to, he's trying to nail me down. He said, are you a Calvinist or Arminianist? I said, I'm both. <laughs> and he got mad. He said, no, you can't be both. I said, I am both because the scripture's both. Does the scripture magnify the importance of choosing Jesus, of confessing him with your mouth, believing in your heart, and of preaching the gospel? Because how are they going to hear and respond if we don't go and preach? Yes. So it's important. We have to do that. We have to treat every person out there like they're the elect. So we go after them because we don't know. Only the Lord knows. But he goes, that's right. You go after all of them. Just go after every fish in the pond. Go after all of them. Like you try to hook every single one of those fish. Well, Lord, you know which ones are like, yeah, I know. But I want you to go after every fish. Because mm. I want every creature in all of the earth to hear the gospel. Mm. So you just assume that they're there. Mm. And the Lord knows who are his. And he's going to hook those. You, you know it's not our presentation of the gospel that hooks them, right? Amen. It's not because we're super clever. And I'm, listen, I really know how to make the Lord know. It's not our cleverness in presenting the gospel that makes men respond to Jesus. That's what Paul said. This was a smart dude here. Like I would wager to say he was probably smarter than all of us in this room. When I came to you, I did not come with enticing words of man's wisdom presenting to you the gospel. But I determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when I was with you, I was with you in fear and trembling. Not trusting myself. Do you know what the Corinthians said about Paul? You know why they dissed him? His speech is contemptible and his bodily presence is weak. That they were used to dynamic Greek orators. That wasn't who Paul was. He wasn't some clever lure maker that's going to hook the fish. He relied upon the Holy Spirit to do the job. And the Holy Spirit came behind him and did the job. Yeah. But they weren't impressed with Paul. He wasn't slick. <laughs> How does the rest of Scripture get treated? This is a big deal. And then the third thing, this has been mentioned. It's like, good, you guys did awesome. <laughs> really, I mean, you picked up the three points that I was going to pull right, right now. So good for you. How does it affect the lifestyle of those who follow? So Paul talks about, in verse 16, avoid worldly empty chatter, it will lead to further ungodliness. And then in chapter 3, you're gonna, we're going to see this verse where he says, evil men will wax more and more evil. Like there's, there's a trend line that happens. This is what happens in false teaching. There's a trend line that happens. It starts out in the morality of the life goes in a downward spiral as you follow the deception. But that's generally what happens in, in false teaching. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And everyone, say everyone. Everyone. Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So what's Paul saying? Look, even though these guys are out there spreading gangrene in the body with false teaching, and there's people being deceived, don't worry about it. Those that the Lord knows are His are not going to fall for it, at least not permanently. Hmm. And here's an identifying characteristic of those who belong to the Lord. 
they abstain from wickedness. Hmm. Like, there's something that gets placed inside of a believer when Jesus Christ is their Lord. 1 John 3, 9 says that no one who is born of God can practice sin. Hmm. No one who's born of God can practice sin. You go, well, I, I have sinned yet. You can't practice sin. Why? Because the divine seed, Greek word is spermos, where we get our word sperm, the divine seed of life has been implanted inside of believers, and they cannot, I like Smith Wigglesworth used to say, God is in that cannot. You go, well, I said, listen, God is in that cannot. His life inside of you, if you're a believer, hates wickedness. Now, you might let your flesh, just like a little dog that's not been trained, and runs around wild. You ever go into somebody's house like a little dog just... Maybe it's just me that happens to um, <laughs> Yeah, Put that dog on a leash. Mm. Come on, put the choke collar on it. This is what you have to do to the flesh. But inside of a believer's heart, they love righteousness and they hate sin. That's true believers. Everyone who names the name of the Lord now in a large house, verse 20, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. So you have a gold vase that you put pretty flowers on the table, and then you have a wood urn that you put trash in, and then you have a ceramic thing that you use for your toilet. They're all vessels in the house. Some are more honorable than others. Some you don't show to your friends when they come to the house, but not showcases, right? the same way. This is what he's saying. And so, I think the point here is, like, those who get off in the false are actually the vessels that are not honorable. They're dishonorable. But, but you know something? Here's the, here's the thing about God's sovereignty. Everything in the end serves His glory. Amen. You read Romans chapter 9. I know this isn't like a chapter that is really popular probably to preach on, but Romans chapter 9, Paul says, uh, why, why do you say if he has hardened some and he's, you know, um, opened the hearts of some, you're, you're going to accuse God of being unjust? And, and, and Paul's response to that is, who are you to say to the potter, you that has the clay, why did you make me like this? Like, who are you? Who are you? What, what is this lump of clay doing? pontificating and philosophizing about what divine and uh, universal justice is like. Well, well okay. he's like, well, who are you? Who gave you the thought? Like, God does what he wants in the universe. He's sovereign. And I know that scares a lot of people. But look, at the end of the day, everything that God does is good and right. He's vindicated and righteous. When he judges the ungodly, he's righteous and he's good. Have you ever heard Revelation chapter 16? These are chapters we haven't read. So these are places where we haven't read. So let me just bring them out to you. Okay? The plagues are being poured out on the earth. And judgment's being poured out upon the earth. And all of a sudden, in chapter 16 of Revelation, the saints begin to break out in worship. Lord, you're right. When you judge the ungodly and the sinner and those who are about to get you, you're doing right. And they begin to worship. Because this is what the saints say. They deserve it. They deserve it. So you're actually showing your righteousness and your holiness. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 9. That if he wants to take some who are vessels of wrath and show his power and his righteousness, everybody at the end glorifies God. Some by receiving his love and mercy and tenderness and goodness. And some by receiving the rightful justice of his judgment. That's just plain teaching of scripture. God is sovereign and the almighty. And he's good. Everything that he does is, is good and right. Um, 
Okay, so this is the vessel. Verse 21. Uh, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. What does it mean if anyone separates himself from these things? What, what's he talking about? Separate yourself from what? Say hello? Okay. In this context, like what are the things you separate yourself from? Okay. Right. He's getting ready to go into that. Like you jumped the verse ahead, but you're right. No, that's good. So, but like, in, what is he just talking about? What things are they? Are we supposed to cleanse ourselves from? False teaching. False teaching. Yeah, that's in the context. God this chatter, okay, that would be part of the false teaching. What else? Arguments and genealogies. Okay, right, that's part of the false teaching, yeah. From iniquity. Say it again. Apart from iniquity. Yeah, wickedness, right? You just talked about wickedness. From the false teaching, from wickedness, and from maybe from vessels of dishonor, right? I mean, you just talked about that thing. So, like, who you hang with is a big deal, right? Be not deceived. This is, this, whenever Paul says be not deceived, that means... Get ready. Yep. Wait for it. There's a lot of people being deceived right here. Yep. In the church. Wait for it. Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Paul himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Why did he say be not deceived? A lot of people are deceived there. Oh, no, brother, I can hang with them. Missionary dating. I'm just going to convert him, right? Probably not. Probably not. Probably it's going to work the other way. That's why he says, don't be unequally yoked. And we're not smarter than God. I know what you think sometimes. Lord, you really just don't know who you've got here. <laughs> I'm a little sharper than the average pencil in the cup. But he's like, you're not. You're, you're as blunt as a spoon, actually. <laughs> yep. God's wisdom is, is good and wise. Okay, um, verse 22. So let's let's cleanse ourselves. Let's sanctify ourselves so we can be useful for the master. So we separate ourselves from those things. Now, verse 22. Now flee from youthful lust. This is one of the times where the Bible doesn't say stand and fight. And so I tell young men, like, you don't go to the screen of your computer. <laughs> You don't do that and think that you're going to fight porn right there. Like, no. You flee from it! And if you have to, you take your computer and you get rid of it. Or you make yourself accountable. You humble yourself and you go, dude, like, I can't handle this computer. I'm hooked on porn, so I can't handle this. I have to flee from this. So every time I'm going to sit right here at this table to where you can see the screen or I'm not going to use my computer. And I'm going to take my smartphone and I'm going to throw it in the trash and I'm going to get a dumb phone that I can't get on the internet. <laughs> you don't think that's wise? You don't think that's wise? Yeah, it's wise. Why would you want to be so smart and suave and then you're bound in sin and you can't get free from it because you thought you could stand and fight it. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm strong enough. You're not. You flee youthful lust and you do what you have to do. And if you make yourself look like a fool and humble yourself in the process, praise God because God's grace comes to the humble and he exalts those who lower themselves in his presence. I have a good friend who's a, a pastor and he has a dumb phone. To this day, and he won't have a smartphone because he does not want there to be any temptation in his life. I applaud him for it. People think he's stupid. I think he's brilliant. Okay, that's just my opinion. I didn't get any shouts, but nevertheless, <laughs> flee from youthful lust. Flee from youthful lust. Pursue. You, you turn and run and you chase after these things. Righteousness. Faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Did you see what he said? You see where the pure heart comes from? You see where the pure heart comes from? It comes from your running. You run from certain things and you run after.
after certain things, that's demonstration of a pure heart. It's a demonstration of a pure heart. Before the Lord. Refuse, verse 23. Foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing they produce quarrels. Here's talking about the false teaching again. You know, it's an amazing thing. Some people, I think a lot of times quarreling comes from, um, comes from pride. I've got to be right. Has anybody ever had a fixation? Like, I've got to win the argument. I have to have the last one. This was, yeah, I've, I've been there. Um, actually, not that long ago on a Wednesday night, and this person isn't here, so I'll go ahead and say this because none of you know who it is. But somebody came up to me afterwards, and they'd heard that I had made the statement that, um, you know, in my life, I, since the Lord had really apprehended me, He just in His graciousness made His love known to me in such a, a strong way that I have never really doubted that in my, in my walk with the Lord. It's just really true. And, and He just wanted to challenge me on that. Well, have you ever sinned? I said, yeah, yeah, of course. I sinned. He said, well, then you, you doubted the love of God when you sinned. I said, not really. I mean, he, he just kept this whole word game up. Like, he just followed me out to the car like the whole time. He's just steady going after me. Come on, I want to answer. I want to answer. And just going after me. I'm like, really? Dude, like, we're not going to agree on this, okay? Like, <laughs> but he would not take no for an answer. And I finally had to say, you know what, bro? Like, this is not fruitful. We're not understanding each other here. So what are we? What are we doing? Um, I've known some folks like that in my life where they just had to get the last one and had to argue, had to had to beat you down so they could conquer you. Like that's that's not godly, <laughs> and it's pointless. Um, I don't know. I just came to mind when I was looking at this verse. Um, refuse ignorant and foolish speculations, knowing they produce quarrels. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. Okay, arguing is not a fruit of the spirit. You be kind to all. Able to teach, patient when wronged. This is the Christ-like character in action. See, this is kind of amazing to me because Paul is giving Timothy instruction on how he's supposed to deal with the false teachers and the people that are caught up in that. He, he, he didn't tell them to go in there with a hammer and knock them in the head. He told them to be patient and just continue to show Christ-like character, not to argue. Um, verse 25, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, it perhaps... God may grant them repentance. Who's, who's going to grant them repentance? Anybody ever dealt with people who were in the cold and came to your door? Like, I actually enjoy talking with them when they come to the door, whether it's uh, Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, because I just like to ask them questions about things. And um, so I was asking Mormons one time, really nice. I mean, very friendly. You know, you know how the difference is. Sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses get a little bit rough. But, <laughs> but Mormons are very, very polite and... Um, Appreciate that, but we were talking about the whole thing that Joseph Smith and about you know history and about the history of Scripture and we we started talking about all this stuff. I said, you know, I like where do you guys get this stuff? And I was asking them, oh well, they, they think that Scripture has been corrupted over time and stuff. Like I said, you know, we have the writings of the the, the disciples of the very first apostles, like Polycarp, his writings was a, a disciple of the. You know, the Apostle John, I said, like, we have the, I said, dude, I have the writings in my study right here. Like, you want to go back there and we can read some of that? And see if we got the gospel wrong, like if it got perverted over the years? And he said, like, I just feel like I need to probably leave now. I mean, but it was cool. I mean, it's cool. I, I, uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity. But you know what? Here, here's the adage that holds true. This is really true. Did you see where it says that God might grant them repentance? It's not that we're going to win the argument. He, he, here's the adage. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Okay? You, you can convince somebody and win the argument, but if God doesn't give them repentance, they won't change their mind. They won't. So, you know what? Praise God. It takes the pressure off. We, we don't have to be some skilled debate or what we know. It's just a simple word. It's just a simple, simple word. The Lord can take anything. One of the communists that was infiltrating this country um, years ago, he, you know, they, they were, they had moles in, our, in the U.S. government where they were giving our information to the Russians. And um, this guy was a key player. 
You know how the Lord converted him? You know how he came to faith in Christ? He had a little baby daughter. And he just began to look at her ear. He said, there, there's no way that that is accidental. That ear was created. <laughs> this is an atheist. Do you know that was the beginning of his... He got soundly converted, so much so that he spilled the beans and told the whole plot to the U.S. government. How did all of the spies that were in high positions in the U.S. government? God doesn't need our cleverness. He just needs our willingness to speak. It doesn't have to be articulate. It's God who gives repentance. It's God who turns the heart. That's really good news. That they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. You see what deception is? It's a snare of the devil and they have been held captive by him to do his will. That's pretty strong language, is it not? That's pretty strong language. Captive of the devil. Okay, so we're down to chapter 3 now. Not too bad. What time do we have, friend? Uh, 840. 840, okay. All right, we're going to make it through. No. Um, <laughs> verse 3, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. Realize this. That in the last days, difficult times will come. When did the last days start? When's that? Yeah, at the resurrection of Jesus is when the last days began. So we're in the last days, and maybe we're in the last of the last days, but we're definitely somewhere in the last days. Difficult times will come. Verse 2. This, this is striking to me. For men... I want you to notice in this passage, when he's talking about difficult times, you could translate this word as being brutal. Okay? It's very brutal. Really hard. What, what characterizes these times? Look at the, the words and the description of what people love. And you'll see why the times are difficult. Look, look, look at this. Verse 2. Men will be lovers of self. self. Lovers of money. money. Boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good. The Greek there says not lovers of good. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure. Come on, say it loud. Lord, you, you're living in this culture, aren't you? Do you, do you live in America? Yes. Do you live in America? Yes. Okay. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yet, this is striking. Look at that list that we just read. Like, that's a pretty rough list. Yet they're still holding to a form, an outward form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Um, lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. Is that, yeah. is that, does any of that ring a bell? <laughs> can, can I just put this out here for you? Okay, Not trying to, to be controversial, but... This is the only time in the Bible that the Bible talks about self-love, is in this verse. Um, and it's not in a good way. Um, I, would, I would like for this, okay? Hear, hear what I'm saying. Okay, we, we have a lot of, of talk about loving yourself and self-love and um, even in the church there's a lot of that. I would like for that to be clarified, okay? Not that I'm going to be able to do it here, <laughs> per se. I think it's always helpful to use Bible terminology rather than stuff that's made up. Um, when, when we talk about loving ourselves, I think what we're trying to say is, and I, I say we even though I don't use this terminology, um, I, don't, I, I think it's confusing. I think what people are trying to say is that we should respect ourselves or you know, you know, feel all of that kind of stuff. Here's what I would like to say about all of that. Um, it really is an invention of the last 30, 40 years in the church. It never was in the church 
uh, until then, and it, it was born out of psychology, and the church kind of co-opted it and made it into a Christianized sort of a thing. If you read old books, and I do read old books, um, all throughout church history, self-love was always viewed in this light here. That's a bad thing. <laughs> it's equivalent to being self-absorbed. Um, and that's what it means here. Lovers of self, many of you are absorbed with yourself. And everything surround. I'm the center of the universe. Um, I know that's not what people mean when they try to promote self-love. You have to have a healthy self-image and all these sorts of language. It's just not Bible. Here's my observation, okay? I think when we go after that, we're going about it in the wrong way. The way that the Bible wants us to be content and happy to be us is that we've been loved and embraced by God. And so if you pursue a healthy self-image, this is my observation, you never get it. If that's your pursuit, then you end up using God to try to get that for yourself. God, love me so I'll feel good about myself. No, 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 no. The, the, the Bible teaches, in my view, forget about yourself. It's not about you. But go after the heart of the Father, and you will find a Father who loves you so thoroughly and completely that you're going to be happy to be you. Very happy to be you because you belong to Him. If you chase after improving your self-image, your self-worth, and your self-love, it's like chasing the wind. You can never get enough of it. Then you still... This is my observation. I'm just, I'm just putting this out there, okay? I, I, I'm an advocate for using Bible terminology because I think otherwise it becomes very confusing, okay? So I'm not a fan of using the self-love thing. I think it's confusing. But if you want to use that, it won't hurt my feelings. I won't twitch when I see you. Nothing like that. But, but I think we should be clear about what we're talking about because it's confusing. When you read this verse and you go, lovers of self, this is difficult. This is the end times of evil, wicked people reigning. And they love themselves. Yeah, but I want to love myself. Don't seek after that. Leave that alone. And go after the heart of God. And pray that the Lord himself will make his love for you in Christ Jesus abundantly, clearly known to you then you'll find a sense of great happiness in you living and breathing and existing because then you'll finally find where you belong and you'll find the reason that you exist is to bring glory and honor to the Lord and to love Him and to enjoy Him forever. What is the goal of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. And ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. And he who overcomes, I'll make him like a pillar in the temple of my God. And he'll never go out again. <laughs> but in heaven there is no temple. Well, how? But the Lamb is the temple. I don't know if that fires you up. My new motto is, on fire till I expire. Like, I, that's, I'm going to live in the temple. The Lamb is the temple. Goodness. Like, if, you, if you haven't found out or if there's been confusion in this life, like your real heart's desire is Jesus himself and nothing else. Everything else is sawdust in your mouth compared to that. Everything. It's amazing. Let the Lord love you and make his love real to you. I, I, it pains me to see people chasing after affirmation from people and have people try to convince you that you're loved and valuable. Like, people can convince you of that. The Father God who said that I brought you forth because I wanted you to myself. You, you wanted me? Like, this is, this is the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. But, I, but I'm all in. <laughs> I'm all in. This stupid, ignorant, candy bar loving fool. God came after and said, I want you. And I'm like, you did? Why? He said, because 
into a heart that's bigger than you can understand. And I want you in my family. Well, why? Forever. I'm going to lavish upon you my grace and my goodness. Not just in this life, but throughout all of eternity. This is how you're going to live forever. Like, we only know this much now. We only know this much. This is where you find your sense of happiness in being you. It's because God made you for himself. Because he loved you. It just pains me for people to be chasing after the wind and they can never quite get it. And you can have an altar call every single week for that. And the same people will come up over and over again. And it pains my heart. The love of God is bigger than the universe. That's why he says the height, the depth, and the width, the length, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. It's bigger than you can get inside of your head. You have to experience the everlasting arms wrapping around you and going, you're mine, you're mine. You are mine and I am yours. And you're like, this is insane. So saying, yeah, it is. But it's life in Christ and it's beautiful and it's powerful. And you don't have to ever again strive for affirmation. Like, you can't be that. Holding a form of godliness, although they have denied his power, avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. You see what these false teachers were doing? They're putting on the, the dog with the women with their teaching, getting them to support them financially, and going into their homes and seducing them. You see how the deception spirals down into moral bankruptcy. It's false teaching. They're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a blindness, that's a hard thing. Just as Janice and John Brace opposed Moses, these are, it's not in the Old Testament, but you know that the, when Moses went before Pharaoh and he brought his magicians out there and they made snakes and Moses and his snake ate their snakes, you know, this kind of thing. They're just Jewish tradition and Christian tradition has always put these names on these guys. Um, and so, must be right. Um, Verse 8, Janus and John Brace opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Talking about the false teachers, men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and John Brace's folly was also. I think what he's saying there is this kind of stuff with them going and seducing women and all this stuff, it eventually it comes to the surface and people begin to recognize, hey, that's not, that's not cool. This is the amazing thing about cults. Like, if you've ever studied cults much, a lot of times, most of the time, it, um, especially if it's just a tightly held kind of thing like the Jim Jones and British Guiana, it, it, it ends up being really sexually perverse. Um, because deception is from the devil, and when the devil holds you captive, then he begins to move you towards his ways and his purpose and that was just really weird when they were swapping spouse and all kinds of just weird stuff this is not uncommon just telling you there is a component false teaching almost always leads to moral depravity and spirals downward because the enemy is in control um verse 10 now you follow my teaching my conduct my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance. Notice what Paul's saying. He says, Timothy, this is what true godly leaders look like. They have these nine qualities. Look at my teaching. Is it all about Christ Jesus? Yes, it is. Is it embrace all the scripture? Yes, it does. Does it lead to godly living? You know about Paul's when he talks about sound teaching in, the, in these letters, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, the word sound there actually is the Greek word for healthy. 
It's a medical term. Healthy teaching. And Paul says, what does healthy teaching look like? It makes people live in a Christ-like and a godly way. So if teaching is online, it should make people want to live holy, want to live pleasing to the Lord, want to live right and righteous before Him. If it doesn't do that, there's probably, I mean, there could be something wrong with the person, but the teaching should move in that direction. That's sound and healthy teaching. It produces a godly and Christ-like life. Um, follow my teaching, my conduct, the way that I live my life. Like, dude, you've lived with me, you've been around me on these missionary journeys. How have I lived? You see me sneak away and get a prostitute at night? No, no, man, no, of course not. No, you didn't, you didn't see that. Do you see me cheat people when I was making tents? Do you see me mark stuff up and say, huh? No, no, I never saw that. Like, you were all about Jesus and everything that you did. Yeah, keep that in mind. Your conduct. You, you, you know what my purpose is like. Like, Timothy, do you understand my heart? Like, what am I all about? What do I want to do with my life? Oh, Paul, I, I've heard you say, it doesn't matter whether you live or die. Like, what matters is that the Lord Jesus Christ is exalted in your body, whether by life or by death, you're all about. Look, look, let me tell you something. I, I love Paul. I don't know of any person... Of course, we have his writings, so that helps. But like, have you ever seen a person that is more, has a more of a razor sharp focus in their life than this guy? I mean, razor sharp, not dull at all. Like his focus is razor sharp. For me to live is, and to die is, <laughs> what? So the description for me, like for me, life means Christ. Everything about Jesus. This is a razor-sharp focus. I love it. So, Timothy, what about my purpose? Oh, yeah, razor-sharp. Have you seen my faith? Have you seen my patience, my love, and my perseverance? Here he goes again. Here goes Paul again into his theology of suffering, okay? Persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. And what persecutions I endured. And out of all of them, the Lord rescued me indeed. Verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will, will, can you say will? Will. Might? Will. No. will. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecution functions as an indication of our pursuit of godliness. Look at these nine qualifications, he says, and you'll see what it's supposed to look like. But evil men and imposters, verse 13, will proceed from bad to worse. You see the downward spiral. Can you see that? Evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, what's the remedy? What's the remedy to the false teaching? Continue in the word of God. Yeah. He, he hid it in verse 15 of chapter 2. Be diligent, present yourself, approved to God as a workman. Rightly, accurately handling the word of truth. It's all about the word. This is what we use. This is our weapon against false teaching and false doctrine. You hold to the word. You preach it. You're faithful to it. You stick with it. You, however, continue. This is verse 14 in chapter 3. Continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of. Knowing from whom you've learned them. And that from childhood you have known the what? Scripture. The sacred writings. The scriptures which are able to give you the wisdom. That leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, the scriptures lead to wisdom. The scriptures lead to faith for salvation. Verse 16. All scripture. Every scripture. Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy, Genesis, 2 Kings, 1 Kings, all scripture is inspired. It's breathed by God. The, the Greek word there is just powerful. It's breathed by God. The, the scripture is breathed by God. Do you know when you read the scripture and you take it into your heart for real, like you're breathing in the breath of God into your soul. Like, I just really can't get in the Bible. Please. Don't, don't, you don't breathe with your head. You, you, you need to use your 
use your head when you breathe. I get that. But that's not where you breathe. You breathe in your heart and your soul. And you let it go down through your head. And you go, oh, breathe in. You go, I don't know how to do that. Just keep walking on the Lord. show you how to do it. And you just keep walking. You just take one verse out of quickness of your heart. And you just start to pray. And pray it back to him. And speak it to him. And think about it. Like, breathe it. Breathe it. Breathe it. It's life. The enemy, the enemy throughout all of church history has tried to get people not to read the Bible. Just even, even if it was the, the church hierarchy saying you can't have the scripture in your own language. And these guys gave their life to translate scripture so people could have it. Or just laziness or just apathy or just distraction of like... We have in the English language, you know how many trans I have over a hundred different English translations of the Bible in my library. I don't have them all. We're so blessed. We're crazy blessed. Most languages, if they have it at all, have maybe have one. Even a language as, as big as Spanish, they only have a few. Like in English, we have more translations by far, by scores, and by scans than any other language group. We're crazy. So how does the enemy go, ah, entertain yourself with your mind on the, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, this is the breath, this is breathe, this is breathe by God. <laughs> that fires you up. Breathe this breath in your soul. You don't think it'll change you? You don't think it'll change you? You don't breathe with your head. Let it get down through your head and breathe it. It will change you. It will change you. Absolutely. It's breathed by God. All scripture is inspired. Breathed by his breath. It's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof. Yeah. So we don't have a theology of suffering in the American church, and we don't have a good theology of reproof either, okay? <laughs> Somebody tell me, what, what is reproof? What's reproof? Discipline. Correction. It's correction, yeah. Reproof's not generally, uh, here's the dictionary definition of reproof, to scold or to correct, usually gently with kind intent. So if you get any of that, it's always with kind intent from the pulpit and heart of the Father. Sometimes you don't feel it. I get it. Okay. I know I get a little wound up sometimes with that. But from my heart, my heart, my heart is for, you know, full page of verses from Proverbs that talk about reproof. We should have a theology of being good receivers of reproof, yes. We're not good at it. We're, in fact, we're lousy at it. Listen to some verses. He who ignores reproof goes to strike. You want the verses? Anybody want these verses? Want me to throw out the verses? This is 10 17, okay? He who ignores reproof goes to strike. This is 12 1, Proverbs. He who hates reproof is stupid. Is that blunt enough? Yeah. You guys think I'm blunt? Like, I'm. Good. Solomon, like, he who hates reproof is stupid. 13, 18. He who regards reproof will be honored. 15, 5. He who regards reproof is sensible, is wise. 15, 10. He who hates reproof will die. 15, 31. He whose ear listens to life giving reproof will dwell among the wise. 15, 32. He who listens to reproof acquires understanding. 29.1. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. 6.23. Reproofs for discipline are the way of life. 9.8. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. So here's how you can tell if you're wise or not. When someone reproves you, if you love them, you're wise. If you get ticked off, you need to walk out. 
And then this is one of my favorite verses. I had this on my desk for years on a note card. It's David in Psalm 141, verse 5. He says, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. Did, did, did you hear what he said? Listen, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil on my head and my head will not refuse it. We need, in order to be wise, in order to grow, in order to be all that we should be, we're so, listen, we are so easily offended in our culture. It's ridiculous. We're, we're, and, and you know what happens? The enemy uses that to make us so that we don't, we can't receive any correction. Because we buck up against it. Do, do you know the Lord will send people to you to reprove you that you don't like and, you're, and that irritate you? Yes. Have you ever had something? Like, a lot of times he sent people to me to reprove me, and I'm like, I just bite my tongue. I'm like, mm, Lord, I know that's you. I, say, I know his ways now. Like, I know it. They come like, I really need to talk to you about something. I'm like, okay, Jesus, come on. <laughs> we need to be good reprovers. I had someone email me one time, and um, it was just all about you know, what they felt like the Lord was correcting me on. And um, it, it really wasn't right. Um, it wasn't correct. But their heart was so good. You know, when I sent them back an email. I said, thank you so much for reaching out and saying that. I said, honestly, I said, I really don't see that. But I have been blind before, and I'm going to take that before the Lord and, and take it very seriously. But I want you to know how much I appreciate it because I know how hard it is to reach out and to bring forth the word of correction. That's hard. And I said, thank you for taking that risk. I love you. And if you were here, I would kiss your feet. For real. <laughs> you, you want to be honest. <laughs> you want to be Christ-like and go into full stature. You have to be good at receiving correction. That doesn't mean that all correction is right. You know what happens a lot of times when you receive correction? Part of it's right and part of it isn't. And you know what you have to do? You have to go, Lord, that's the part that's right. I want that. Let that oil run down my head. It's kindness to me. We need the theology of being able to receive a proof. I'm going to close with this story. What's that? Psalm 141 5. Yeah. Put that one on a card. It's, uh, it's awesome. The NIV is my favorite of that. It's really good. David, his son is coming to take the kingdom from him by force. He doesn't want to fight. So he abdicates. He's walking out of Jerusalem with his entourage. It's the lowest moment of his life. He's walking along a hill. Dejection. His own son betrayed him, taking the kingdom. David's walking with his mighty man next to him. Here comes a little guy on the side of the ravine. His name is Shimei. He's running along, and he's yelling at David. He's saying, you're the reason that all of the wicked and bad things have come upon Israel. You're the reason. You're... And he's throwing rocks at David, yelling at him. And David's mighty men, there are no slouches, do you read the exploits of those mighty men? <laughs> They're scary guys. And they had all they could take, and they said to David, why do you listen to this dog? Let us go now and cut his head off. <laughs> and David, this is David's greatness, listen to him. This is the one who wrote Psalm 141. Line. This is David's greatness. He says, no. For how do I know that the Lord didn't send him? This is greatness. This is the king of Israel. This is his lowest moment. In the midst of his pain, here's a guy throwing stones at him, 
yelling at him that he is the reason for all the wars in Israel. And he says, how do I know that the Lord didn't send him, leave him alone? It's greatness. It's greatness. You wonder why the Lord loved David. You see the humility in his heart? It's incredible. It's incredible. He had the power to just go with that. He was dead. That's humility. That's somebody that you know how to take the proof. And you know what? The story ends. The Lord didn't send him. The Lord did not send Shimei to do that. David found that out later. But at the moment, he wanted to make sure that he wasn't walking up against the Lord, correcting and proving him. Let's pray this. Stand by me. Can you say to the Lord, yes, Lord, let your word reprove me. Let your word correct me. Give me a humble spirit that receives all that you have for me. Father, I pray that you would make me, would you, would you ask the Lord to make you, to have a humble spirit to receive correction from his word, that he could make you everything that he wants to be. He is a good master gardener. And when the tree is bearing much fruit, what does he do? He prunes it. He cuts it back so that it will produce more fruit. That's what his word does. It prunes us. So, Lord, we just say now, thank you for your holy word. Lord, we embrace all of it. We ask you by your spirit that you would correct us, that you would reprove us when we need it, that you would make us more Christ-like. Lord, we ask you to make us Christ-like, and then we buck up against the methods that you want to use to make us that way. But, Lord, right now we just say whatever you want to do, do it however you want to do it. We just receive whatever you have for us, and we thank you for your holy word. Lord, keep us lined up, rooted and grounded in your holy word and let the breath of God that is in this word breathe inside of us, Lord, and change us into your shape and your image even in greater and greater ways, we pray. Thank you, Father, for those people. I thank you for their heart for you. I pray your blessing upon them. Let your face shine yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you, guys. Thank you.